Welcome to the Lift Your Story podcast with guest Heather Landax, environmental health practitioner. Hi everyone, I am Lorianne. I am that gal from Milton, Ontario, Canada, and I am with... I am that guy. I am Roy Miller from Dallas, Texas. We'd like to welcome you to our Lift Your Story podcast. And in this episode, we're very pleased to have Heather Landex. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. We are glad to have you. And uh, you're in Denmark. At the moment, I'm in Lego House in the center of uh, the, the western side of Denmark. Uh, okay, great. So you're an environmental health practitioner. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So that covers everything in health and safety, including pollution control, food safety, health and safety inspections, that sort of thing, and public health. So obviously, they're quite an important role right now with the pandemic and everything. So it's, it's generally how to control anything that can harm your health in your surroundings. It's preventative health protection. So due to COVID, how much has that impacted what you do? From, from your normal day-to-day -day stuff that you would be doing? Well, in Denmark, about mid-March, everything went to zero. We got locked up for several months. Um, and I think I work predominantly in restaurants and hotels, and that was horrific for them. So whilst I was locked up, I focused on all of the things I haven't had time to do in the last uh, 10 years, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> uh, such as long-winded long qualification processes and I authored a book and that sort of thing. So I've developed my specialism a bit more. What, what's your book about? So my, the title of my book is Inclusive, the New Exclusive. And it's how the food service industry can stop leaving money on the table. And the basic principle is everyone has to be able to eat. So if you're in a group of people, whether it's a family, a work function, a group of friends, anything to do with school or education or conferences, if there's one person in that group that can't eat, that's incredibly awkward. So if there's a place that they know they can be served, they would steer the whole group to go and eat the place that's the most inclusive. Oh, okay. and I have a very good example, actually. I've been invited to a summer party with 300 ladies. <laughs> But the, the disclaimer from the venue is that we don't do dietary preferences, uh, which is quite outrageous in modern day society. Um, and it's because they have a wood fired pizza oven and they're scared of anaphylactic allergy sufferers. But in that way, they're also excluding anyone with an intolerance or anyone who for religious reasons doesn't eat any of the animal products or people with lactose intolerance. And I think it's a general lack of awareness how many people that actually is. So out of 300 ladies, there's already four that, like me, don't feel like attending because we're going to be sat watching other people eat pizza and we're allowed to take our own food, which is a bit, a bit like treating us like outsiders in a, a community where we're all supposed to be connecting. No. Okay. So if you are inclusive, you're also exclusive. That's uh, why there's a little play on words there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I get the back of me there. Laurieann, she she has some food things as well in her background, but I don't know if she wants to talk about those right now. But uh, it's funny you mentioned that, that being inclusive and exclusive, because we don't really think about that. Because, uh, for for example, you know, someone that's vegan, you know, if you're not, you don't even think about it. So you go somewhere and you see, you know, like vegan options or dairy-free options or whatever. You're kind of like, you know, why? What's the big deal? I think sometimes all they need is a little notice or a little cue that says you can contact us about this, that, the other. Or we do, we are able to prepare you something if you give us notice. There's, there's lots of very kind, friendly ways to avoid the inconvenience on the day. And sometimes it's just not clear that they are capable. And so they've missed out on that, potentially a whole group of people. And if it's a hotel, they're also missing out on the, the room price. Mm -hmm. And if it's a conference, they might be missing out on a whole wedding party if they're not able to make something especially nut-free or gluten-free. Gluten-free is a, a very big uh, problem at the moment because they've got better at diagnosing people with gluten intolerance or celiac disease. And obviously, there's a big plant-based revolution I suppose you'd call it where a lot of people are reducing their meat consumption and sometimes it's just nice to have the option 
And I think that choice is really missing that when you go to a venue and you have a dietary preference, you basically get what you're given. That's quite often the attitude of the venue. And it, then it's sort of polluting the whole customer experience. And I think that that customer service value is very, very exciting if you can cater to people. I find that interesting though. Don't the airlines that like given time, you can pre book whatever it is that you would like to eat on the airlines. So I'm finding it amazing that there's areas and places that don't allow for that to this day. I think it is exciting with the airlines that they could even have a deliberately plant-based option to reduce their carbon footprint. So it's the sustainability angle to having these sort of vegan and allergy friendly options. Because if you start with this quite simple, basic meal that is a meal in itself, you can always add cheese or milk or egg or all of these other things to it as the preferred option for those people but I think most people had this discussion with a rather uh let's not innocently naive <laughs> owner of a restaurant and he said he didn't want to serve vegans which I found quite insulting I don't think he knew I was a vegan um but I was just looking for somewhere for the family to eat and we were five and I explained that there is, isn't anywhere in this town that is overtly able to serve us so I have to inquire everywhere and he didn't understand that if he just put on his menu that we can cater to you. Just a little line that says we can make one or two dishes suitable for whichever diet you preference. He didn't understand that that would attract the whole, even if it's 1% of the population and it's a tourist town, that 1% is hundreds of people that would only be able to eat in his restaurant. It's not 1% of his current client, his current customer base. It's 1% of anyone who's looking for somewhere to eat that can cater especially the milk free is a very big market that's probably 20 percent of people don't eat milk that's massive and that's not in people's common sense natural awareness because people generally don't talk about what makes them ill it's not a very good party <laughs> conversation starter oh i get this that the other symptom from <laughs> eating x y or z it's quite remarkable and i think when people are vegan or vegetarian if they get something in their meal that they weren't expecting, it can make them ill and it is a food safety issue. But out in the world, allergies is seen as a very extreme niche market, like 0.0% of people, when actually it's one in 10 or one in, <laughs> one in five that have some kind of food they need to avoid, even if it's something like passion fruit, that, that it could be 20% or more of people have a problem with food. But isn't it quite unbelievable that some people can eat anything and other people could die from eating something that someone else is nourished by. It, it is quite hard for the human mind to imagine someone else's situation there. Well, I guess my awareness came when my oldest grandson was born. He ended up with a nut allergy. So they had him tested. Well, I had no idea how much stuff is around nuts or in places processed. I mean, Mm -hmm. You had to read labels on every ice cream. You had to read it, see that, you know, I mean, it's so many things that are around nuts, you know, that it was hard to find stuff for him at, at some point because it was in a manufactured and the nut, nuts were in that place or, it, you know, whatever. And that was really an eye opening for us of, of how many people are having those issues. And I think a lot of places, especially beyond the manufacturer where it's in a packet you know if it's a caterer or a restaurant or even a takeaway they don't realize the cross-contamination issue mm -hmm. so if it's not on the packet they say oh it doesn't have it in the ingredients and sometimes even the person with the allergy doesn't understand there's a risk so if you eat out there's a risk because if they have peanuts anywhere in the building there could be an accident where they haven't pre-thought about have I actually used the same utensil for something that's got traces of nuts potentially mm -hmm. and this traces or may contain little labels these disclaimers that restaurants quite often say in the eu it's 14 different things they say oh we've got these 14 things in our kitchen when if you actually inquire 
They don't. Quite often there's no peanuts or quite often there's no nuts. They just have this disclaimer because it's complicated and they're scared, especially of people with anaphylaxis. Uh, you know, they could go into shock and die. They're scared of them. So they put this little disclaimer like, don't eat here if you have an allergy. And they think if they're going to be inclusive and cater to people that they're going to be inconvenienced by the effort it takes to make someone a separate dish or to ensure all of the ingredients are safe. But actually that one person might bring you 30 other people in a year and, and if for a restaurant or a hotel returned customer is actually where the profit is because it's very hard to get the first purchase from a customer so this customer journey they make it difficult for people with allergies they don't even say if they can or cannot serve them so that they spend a lot of time online very anxious to know if they're going to turn up be an inconvenience to the people they're with be treated rudely that's quite common that you get sort of a, a wince from the waiter who doesn't know what you're talking about and sometimes peanuts are confused with nuts or they're confused with things that in in some countries coconuts included in other countries it's not uh, or they call they call like squid and things uh mollusks <laughs> and people are like what's a mollusk uh, you know to be fair i have a biology degree and i was still a bit like oh yeah squid's in there hmm <laughs> oh why is that oh i can't remember <laughs> so it's quite complicated for the average person to know how to produce a safe meal for someone. And even if I, I had a babysitter who has a peanut allergy and she is, has a problem with other nuts as well, even at the slightly separate, and she might even react to some of the beans because it's that severe. She has nearly died six times. But when she comes to look after my children, I wash them. <laughs> I wash them before she's allowed to look after them because I'm scared that they've eaten nuts somewhere you know, in childcare, or maybe we had peanuts a few weeks ago in the house and I'm just like, uh, let's just clean things. <laughs> but she won't eat in our house. And I think that's her own. Uh, so she doesn't get anxious that she might have a problem while she's been left alone with children. And even when she goes on a plane, she's been asked to sign a disclaimer. If I die on this plane, it's not the airline's responsibility, which is outrageous. Uh, and then the, even a very low cost airline can have a procedure where they tell the other passengers, please don't open nuts on this plane. There's an, a person with a peanut allergy. That's the best they can do. There's always going to be a risk if you're on a plane with a peanut allergy or any type of severe allergy. There's always a risk that someone sat in that seat and they had it on them. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about millions, <laughs> tiny molecules of something that could kill you. And I think that level of risk is acceptable. You can say you can serve someone with that level of risk, one in a million, I think, it's this if you call something free from people think they're taking on extreme liability when actually if you've done everything you should have done you still have this protection against negligence and it's actually the accusation of something and it's the same for food poisoning if you're accused that costs you money no matter what you're liable if you injure someone you're liable it's how it works <laughs> and that's why people have insurance against you know these extreme accidents and i think that it's unfair to treat people with a disability such as extreme anaphylactic allergies so differently that they're excluded from things it's extreme uh, discrimination That's and it's right. their right to be considered because it's it's reasonable to expect there will be people out there in your in the public so if you're a restaurant there's definitely people in the public that you're trying to serve that have allergies or dietary preferences it's, you should expect it that's really interesting you're saying that because I did have a babysitter, same thing. In fact, the uh, her mother was the one that stopped peanut butter from going to school in the city that we lived in uh, because that was how severe it was. And I was always worried when she came to babysit because I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I hope they don't have any peanuts anywhere, peanut butter, my kids haven't eaten it. Um, but the other thing too that you're saying is I remember having a friend who was a vegan and she wanted a Caesar salad and, and she, she liked it with the fake crouton. I, I'm sorry, the fake uh, bacon, like, you know, they have the ones that are not. And so she asked them twice, is this real or is this the, the non-real bacon? And they go, oh, it's not the non-real. Well, she got really sick after mm -hmm. it because you can't lie to them. Because as you said, that there will be an effect afterwards. And I think as well, if it's um, a, an ethical vegan, so, so the extreme of veganism, if you lie to them and they find out, they will have a physical reaction because it, it's offended their whole 
values you know it's such exactly. a and i think it would be the same for anyone with any religion where you treat them to have something that's forbidden uh and i don't understand why people would do that do you know who garden ramsey is he's he's sort of notorious for serving vegetarians meat on purpose that should be uh, he should be put in prison for that because that is potentially injurious and i think with plant-based and vegan there's not really a legal definition so that's a danger for allergy sufferers because they will assume that there's not bacon in their vegan option. But quite often, um, if you're using gravies or anything to do with, um, you know, stock cubes, <laughs> anything, to, the base of some tomato sauces has beef in. Even chips sometimes have milk or animal products on them to make the crispy. I had a, um, a little mistake where I'd had some chips that had egg and I couldn't figure out why they should have egg, but maybe it was cooked in the same fryer as something that had egg but then it should have milk probably so sometimes the information isn't clear because you don't know whether they're talking about ingredients traces of or this contamination risk and usually if they're in doubt they put that it's there they, so they exclude the allergy sufferers and that that makes them um, food choice and nutrition and this feeling of being belonging which is very important to humans to belong to society then it, there's all these mental health issues that are associated with allergies including anxiety and it's strange because the symptoms of anxiety are very similar to the starting point of anaphylaxis so you go out to eat you get nervous and then you think am i having an allergy attack and it's sort of a, a negative spiral because if you are stressed you're more likely to have a severe allergy because one of the causes of allergy potentially is the immune system's been influenced or out of balance because of stress and that might be a modern day phenomena that might be why we're experiencing in the world there is an allergy epidemic so this for food businesses you really need to think about your allergy labeling if you're actually excluding people so if you're a vegan restaurant most of your customers are not vegan they're actually avoiding milk or avoiding egg or avoiding shellfish fish it's 80 uh, percent of the customers in the uk's biggest vegan restaurant are not vegan so that's interesting that is that's that, not the perception mm -hmm. no I totally i wouldn't ever have thought that at all so people wince at the word vegan and they wince at the word allergy especially food allergies uh when maybe they're missing 99 percent of the people that have an allergy or an intolerance are not anaphylactic so one in a thousand might be anaphylactic and then there's one in 20 <laughs> or one in 10 one in five that want to avoid that product and even with lactose intolerant I'd want to avoid it because it's embarrassing if I have symptoms it ruins my day I have to again take medication or I have to sort of not trust people because I have to ask lots of questions because they might not have understood that when I'm asking for vegan I'm actually asking for milk free yeah my, my daughter-in-law uh, has lactose intolerance she also has shellfish and then, and then come to find out she's got a, I think it's called Strohensgen's disease. It's, it has to do with her immune system. So she's very cautious. And I think after COVID and being locked up and not getting enough nutrition like vitamin D and all of the stress, like chronic long-term stress that people mm -hmm. feel from the whole situation, that's gonna result in more allergies. Yeah. And even long COVID, I've heard of a lady who's who's had COVID and it's, it's still struggling now. It was before they even knew that it existed. It wasn't a pandemic then. She thinks she had it then. And now she's anaphylactic. I think it's antibiotics or I can't remember if it's antibiotics or um, anesthetic. <laughs> but now she's, uh, now she's scared. So that's another problem that our immune systems are burdened. And it might just be our, our food system's quite complex. We've changed the way we live. We don't go out so much housing's changed and all of these things about environmental health uh even mental health can affect your immunity it is there are more autoimmune problems and allergies not just to food but i have a severe allergy to dust mites and dust mites like humid environments mm -hmm. and if we've got triple glazed windows <laughs> and it's all sealed in for for you know energy efficiency so we're all trying to solve these problems these complex problems and then we're actually triggering something else within the body that's also quite complex with nutrition. And I don't really have a solution, I'm afraid, <laughs> except to be more inclusive on your menu uh, to serve these people. 
Did you want to say something, Lorianne? Uh, I was just thinking this is just all incredible. <laughs> like, never really had a chat about this before, and, and yet uh, it's really not talked about much. Well, if you go on holiday in a, you know, a tour, even on a tour around a city and you're stopping at wine bars or coffee shops, there might be people there that are scared to go inside because they've got peanuts or, you know, it's sort of some, something to consider if you wanted to ever schmooze a client, consider that they might want to have choice of food there. That's quite specific. But if you do go to a, if you do have your favourite client schmoozing venue, <laughs> or a wine bar you go to a restaurant you want one that's got the ability to to adapt their menu to any dietary preference yeah because i know i've been to functions where say vegan or allergies you know and they notify ahead hey i've got two people that are vegans i've got somebody that can't have this so they'll adjust that because you know everybody's got their chicken dinner all of a sudden this guy's got something these what are y'all doing well we're vegan or oh, i can't have this you know so i mean there are there are people that do that that you know uh and i didn't really realize actually that that was really an issue for a lot of people there's other issues as well like at school you'd be you'd have your name on the wall with a photograph don't feed this child milk and actually you talked about peanuts and um, nuts they're the most famous allergies because mm -hmm. they are deadly and it is quite common. Um, but actually milk's the biggest killer, especially in the UK. It's high profile in the media at the moment that milk has killed uh, some children. And there's a law, Natasha's law coming out later this year. It's implemented later this year so that there's better labeling of food that they pack in house. If you put something in a packet, you have to put a label on it now, even if you've made it yourself in a restaurant or a cafe. Um, and that's named after someone called Natasha, who's a young lady that died. And then in the U US, you've got um, Elijah's law, and it was a three-year-old that was fed a cheese sandwich when he had a, a dairy allergy, and he died within a very short amount of time. And there's a, a boy in the UK that died because uh, another child threw, a, threw cheese at him, and it just hit him on the skin. I think he had um, eczema as well, and it, he died within 20 minutes. That's quite, quite terrifying to even accept wow. that that is a thing that could kill you or your child. And I have two children, and they're young, and I'm thankful they're not as allergic as me to things so far so far uh, uh, because if I had to watch I think I, I had an, an allergy experience a few years ago where I thought I was had anaphylactic in the back of an ambulance and they said at the hospital avoid milk and I said but I'm vegan and they were like yeah it's really common that there's milk in, in vegan products and that's where what triggered this and I'm, I work in food safety and I know how to read labels but it never occurred to me that this may contain sometimes just mean it contains a lot and that seems unfair but it's because there's, it's a bit of a gray area what it actually means and I think manufacturers think they're doing a good thing or a responsible thing by putting that there but actually it means that people who have an allergy have to t take a risk sometimes because there isn't anything and I think this whole if I had to watch my child in the back of an ambulance rather than myself, I was terrified. It did traumatize me. And that's probably why I even wrote a book about it because I was so obsessed. Um, but if it was my child, I'd, I don't know what I'd do, actually. I probably would just uh, freak out in a helicopter <laughs> and, and be very, very pre-planned, take all my own food everywhere. Whereas I, for myself, I can take my own risk because I can make an educated guest probably better than a normal consumer. When I get to go out to eat, I can see the cues and I can even go in the kitchen and tell them what they're doing wrong. But if it was my child, I wouldn't trust anyone with them. Like to go to, even to go to a friend's house, it it's really impacts people's lives. Um, that this isn't a thing, like the, the food industry don't acknowledge this is a thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised by that, especially after COVID. You think it'd be like, you know, mm -hmm. magnified. And I think sometimes it's a confidence issue that the, the person making the food, the chef, they're a bit limited by the system. They have to have a bit of tech to help them with the ingredients and they have to have, had, you know, cooperative suppliers. And then they have to have the consumer that uses terminology that's appropriate for the for their ordering system and sometimes the waiter might just stuff it up uh, so there's a lot of pressure on the chef to not serve people 
but they're probably very capable and even creative. And I think sometimes when it's a vegan option, they take everything out because <laughs> nearly everything has milk or cheese. In. And I can understand it does just make the flavor, doesn't it? I think, and especially bacon. <laughs> but there are other vegetables and herbs and spices out there that if, if they pre-plan to expect someone would ask for vegan, they can actually do a lot with what they have already. So I, I did actually help out a quite fine dining restaurant because someone had complained about an allergy. It wasn't really a complaint. It was more that they wanted to be served when they couldn't serve them. And I said, but surely you've got this, that, the other on the menu. You could have made them a quite basic dish. And they hadn't thought of it because they were thinking they had to have something off the menu and they hadn't pre-planned, they hadn't pre-ordered. So they couldn't guarantee that item on the menu was safe for them with a fish allergy. And then I said, uh, but you realize on your menu, you've got 50% vegan items. And they'd even got the allergy information. So I could see that 50% of their menu was vegan, except the afternoon tea. And they said, oh, but we can't produce a vegan afternoon tea that's the same quality. And I'm like, well, on your lunch menu and your evening menu, you have three vegan desserts. So that's one tier of your afternoon tea sorted. To make vegan scones, all you've got to do is take out the dairy and put in a dairy alternative, any dairy alternative, soya, oat milk, whatever you like. You can make scones in a few minutes, you know, 10 minutes, da da da. Um, but the one thing that vegans will miss probably is the, the topping for the, for the scones. Anyway, a few days after we'd had this conversation that they actually had enough vegan options on their normal menus to make an, an afternoon tea, they came out with a 14 allergy friendly vegan gluten-free afternoon tea and it looked it looked the same as an afternoon tea it looked very luxurious and well presented and with with choice rather than just having a sandwich that they've taken everything out <laughs> and uh said it's vegan that's a uh, disappointing i'm not going to pay for an afternoon tea that's just a sandwich <laughs> so heather how can our listeners reach out to you so I'm near the new Heather Landex on the internet, so that's quite easy. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do have a free resources area on my website. It's members.heatherlandex.com, which is also quite easy to remember. And I have a book out. It's on Amazon. You can go to Genius. It's spelled like genie.us and then forward slash inclusive. And that will take you to any, any part of Amazon you need anywhere in the world. Or you can get my book on uh, book.heatherlandex.com but usually you can find me on LinkedIn it's very easy uh, on there and I have some like free videos and things like that for people. Cool great well it's, it's really been interesting you sharing your story because uh, uh, there are a lot of people with allergies and and like you say the average person's concept of what vegan is or what this or what that is is really not exactly what it is yeah and i think that even the individual shouldn't have to decide so a lot of people are scared to say they're vegan because it means they can't have honey or it means they can't do fish whereas i know a lot of people that call themselves vegan and then they go but i make the exception for x y and z and that confuses people but if you're a restaurateur or you have I don't know, even if you're hosting anything really, conference centers, meetings, anything, it's not up to you what someone eats. And if they want to call themselves vegan, they can. And I think sometimes the vegans get against the other vegans or the flexitarians and everyone's trying to put themselves in a box when really you've got the right to eat what you want or not eat what you want. And I think that whole, if they, if they ask for a vegan option, just make sure it's vegan. And if they want to add something to it, like honey, egg, fish, just do it for them. They're the customer. They can eat what they like. And I think that's, it's a judgmental thing, isn't it? It's because someone's different to what you're used to or different to what you think your concept is. But in any restaurant, you're serving all different types of people. Just yeah. assume that some of them have an allergy or a vegan or vegetarian or have a religion that means they can't eat some things together or can't have this part of the animal, that part of the animal. And I think uh, in the future, there will be more plant-based because it's basically going that way with uh, health that we don't know why but you know we're eating too much meat we're eating too much dairy we need to sort of reduce that for health reasons and also it probably gets more expensive as the planet is a bit over occupied right now that it's actually more sustainable to eat plants than animals so there's all these different angles than just being vegan 
for animal activists and extremists and you know a lot of people have a lot of prejudices about the word whereas if you call it plant-based it's actually a huge market of people that want plant-based without that sort of ethical label okay well thank Very you Bart, for being our guest we appreciate it thank you so much for having me okay thank you very thank much you. bye-bye thanks Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to visit us at lifterstory.com.